Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Bad Moments Podcast. My name is Sim. Along with me are my co-hosts, Sheikh Amr Saeed, right there, and Mort. How are you all doing? Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Um, just I was, just some business, business items uh, before we get started. We're going to go ahead and give a shout out to our sponsors, HalfHourDean.com. If you are in the market or you know someone who is in the market, tell them to go to HalfHourDean.com for the private matrimonial experience. Get out of get out of the swipe left, swipe right game. Go and get yourself set up for the private matrimonial experience. Wahedinvest.com is a website that is dedicated to halal investing. Make sure you make sure your returns are in a halal in a in a halal manner. Go to wahedinvest.com. Mywasia.com is a website that is set up by none other than Joe Bradford. Sheikh Joe set up this website so that you can create an Islamic will in as little as 15 minutes. No more excuses. Get it done. Do not delay. No one knows when they're going to go. And you want to make sure your assets are distributed in the way the Sharia prescribes it. So go to mywasia.com. There's a special link in the description below. And you may, and I think you'll save like 20 bucks or something like that. Don't call me on that. Or don't hold me to that number. But anyway, um, and we are on Patreon.com. Please uh, pitch in a couple bucks a month and set up, help us uh, do this a lot more so that we can pump out more content and your support means the world to us. This is how a lot of these type of programs expand and are able to do so many wonderful things just by a couple bucks a month from supporters like you. Patreon.com backslash the Mad Mom Lukes. Yep, it's investing. Don't think of it as donating. It's investing. Yeah, You're investing in the material that you like most. Think about how much you pay for cable. What? Yeah. what okay, uh, what is it like sixty to eighty dollars a month? This is a couple bucks a month, and you know you're doing it out of the goodness of your heart. You're hopefully, inshallah, getting some uh, reward or um, yeah, keep the train going. Yeah, it's a good investment. Yeah, you, you you're part of the team now. Like we can. You you actually have some credit when you talk to us, you know. Anyway, how y'all doing? We have Hussam Gamea out of uh, New York City. He is a Palestinian rights activist. He is also part of uh, well, the Traversing Traditions blog. Uh, that blog is a great blog, by the way. Just a wonderful effort. We've talked before about it. Um, the founder of the blog is uh, Imani, right? Um, so uh, uh, all of us were we basically yeah. co-founded at like one. She's time, like right? the editor, I think. Um, yeah, she's she's one of the editors. Yeah, right, she's editor right. in chief. Yeah. So uh, Hussam does that as well, and you're also involved in a lot of activity. Like when you Google your name, Hussam, the uh, <laughs> the, the right wing doesn't like you very much. <laughs> you, uh, you're accused yeah. of being Muslim Brotherhood, all kinds of nonsense. So, uh, how did you get on their blacklist? Um, I don't know if it was the right wing or the Zionist organization. Yeah, the Zion. It seems like a, what's a canary or something. <laughs> canary. Which, probably, yeah, the, yeah. Probably they, Pamela uh, Geller, wasn't it? They, That's a. Uh, they keep a record of all the people who are against anti or are, are anti BDS. No, uh, against uh, Israel or pro BDS. Or yeah. Or, right. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, so uh, I got on last year because I went to a, a national SJP, SJP conference where I spoke at at length about, you know, solidarity with Palestine, what that looks like, etc. And I had like some choice quotes, I guess, in that, uh, in that, uh, in that talk. Um, also, you know, from, you know, things I post on Twitter, I'm very vocal about my opposition to Israel. Um, and Facebook as well. Um, but, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, nothing on there, like, they, the way they try to twist, you know, my words, it's very obvious it's a twist. Nothing on there really sounds anti-Semitic. I know there's some people on there who they have, like, like uh, posts where they're, like, literally making dua against the Jews or whatever. <laughs> like, I don't got anything like that, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, alhamdulillah, you know, there's nothing like that on there. Um, yeah, that's basically how I got on the list. Um, I think it's a badge of honor. Uh, yeah, you know, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I was looking for my name on their website, and I was <laughs> very disappointed. I'm like, damn it, we're not, we didn't even get on their list. Everyone else has made it. I guess yeah. we're just too nice. We're not big enough yet. I don't yeah. know. Um, they, a bunch of them listen, I know that. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll work with it. Now that we got Hussam on, hopefully we can... Hopefully kinda, we get blacklisted. We, we get some credit. <laughs> Hussam, I don't know if you listen to the podcast every every episode but we were kind of talking about setting up our own like intellectual dark web you know about the intellectual dark web that has these yeah, yeah. sicko fans like you know sam harris Dick and, Rubin, and all sam these harris, mark yeah. rubin but they kind of label themselves as a dark web and of sorts and we're, we're we were like talking about a renewed <laughs> effort in our team that we're going to bring on our own activists who, who, ha- who aren't being given the platform that they deserve so We've kind of talked to uh, your people like yourself. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Raja. Yeah. You know Raja out of uh, New York as well. Yeah, you, I mean, close, close with him. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. We're, we're like, you know what? Enough's enough. We gotta give our own boys some platforms, uh, and, and we gotta make sure that they're getting heard because clearly the major institutions of America are not doing that. They've they've got their their circuit set up, and we're not part of the discussion because. For whatever reason, we're just maybe too blunt. What do you think about that? Uh, I don't. I definitely think it's not just that. I think um, there's like an active, you know, mission or an active, you know, strategy against, um, you know, Islam as a deen. Um, and uh, you know, anybody who does not conform to that mission um, is a problem or is somebody that they don't want to give a platform to, you know, whether that's in the form of support for, uh, you know, political, you know, issues like Palestine or, you know, quote unquote Islamists or whatever, or just, you know, preaching basic Orthodox Islamic beliefs on, you know, several different issues, whether it's like LGBT or, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Any, any other issue like you could think of that doesn't really conform with like Western or liberal values, um, they're kind of blacklisted on their sideline because, you know, the U.S., um, you know, its affiliates, uh, the institutions, uh, and the people that they promote are, you know, whether co- not necessarily, it's like it's not like some big, you know, conspiracy behind the scenes or anything like that, but, you know, generally speaking, they are, you know, working on some level to, to, to assimilate Muslims by distancing themselves them from islam as a deen right um and restricting islam to being like a cultural identifier right right well so. i don't know um if you heard about the, that one sister who recently you know got into a, a fight in a school and a lot of uh, a lot of people w- went to social media and and you know they called it islamophobia this is syrian refugee um, I know you have your thoughts on that. For me, I I kind of held my res. I was a little bit more reserved before making a comment regarding it because I didn't hear the whole story. Uh, there's obviously the video image or the the video file that's been circulating. Um, you know all the media organizations, but in terms of Islamophobia, do you think we're we're kind of quick to pull the trigger on it? Or do you think that um, it's not it's not uh, something that we talk about enough? Um, so at least with regards to that incident, um, I couldn't like bring myself to really like watch the video extensively because um, I don't know it's just something I don't like seeing. Like I feel like it's embarrassing for the sister involved to have something like that circulate. Um, I get like it's for awareness and stuff like that, um, um, but. You know, as somebody who, when I grew up in New York, I grew up post 9-11, right? I was like nine years old, eight years old. Um, I experienced, and I didn't grow up around Muslims, where I grew up. I grew up in the Bronx. My school didn't have any Muslims. I was like one of nine Muslims out of like 400, 500 kids. Um, And in terms of being openly Muslim, I was one of the only ones who was openly Muslim. So, you know, it's really difficult to, you know, deal with that on your own as a child or as a teenager or what have you, um, when you don't have a broader community. 
um, at least with regards to like some of the reactions that I see two reactions. There's the, you know, uh, I guess like the victimization of Muslims, uh, like the victim narrative in the sense of like presenting Muslims as helpless, which I don't like per se. But then I feel like there's another less empathetic uh, narrative that kind of goes around where it's like, again, like I said, the sisters, you know, when you're, when the video is circulating, it's really embarrassing. And that's on top of that, like kind of like, use her as an example of, oh, you guys need to defend yourselves and stuff like that. I think it doesn't help a lot of times, especially for somebody like that girl who's like a refugee, right? Um, and I don't know if with that community, there's a book Muslim community there or not. I think we do need to be more conscious of what we use as examples to start talking about the need to defend ourselves, um, the need to, for people like, you know, learn how to fight and stuff like that. I think that there's a time and place for it. I'm not sure that um these kinds of like incident in, incidences um really help i think i think it just kind of further further is the embarrassment for the person involved um especially because she did you know fight back um she just wasn't you know strong enough or whatever and the, and the girl was bigger right yeah and age discrepancies at that age is a lot bigger than like 26 and like 24 right 24 years old like a 17 year old is like a 15 year old or something like a huge difference. Huge difference. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah, I, I, I know you've you've said um, in private conversations with me that yeah. there's some brothers who kind of blow it out of are, are saying that you know Islamophobia doesn't really exist as much as you think, and you know, I, I when when we're talking, I didn't want to engage with you more because I have, I'm kind of one of those brothers who uh, okay. don't think that that Islamophobia is as bad as people want it to be. Okay. I feel like it's being used by people uh, in our leadership to make a situation much more worse than it is. And I feel like it's harming a lot of the psychology of young Muslims who feel like they may not be able to do things that- They're they, being taught to be victims, basically. Yeah, well, not just that. Like what, what, you're, what you're saying to them is that, hey, you're you're a different type of citizen and you're not going to be treated the same way i was told this when i was growing up i was thinking about going to law or some other things and like oh you're going to be you know subject to this and you're going to be subject to that and that you they won't treat muslims right in or in an equal manner in in certain courtrooms and stuff like that or so just anything that can be made to make our community in a weaker standing i don't like those kind of narratives that are that are being sent to our our children because i feel like while yes it might be politically convenient at this point where you might be getting some kind of recognition or some kind of airtime on tv to to bring these matters to the forefront but in reality you're you're damaging your your the next generation of children uh of muslim children who felt like they could be pursuing certain opportunities but now you've placed place some kind of barrier in their mind um, so I think there's two ways to talk about Islamophobia, right? There's a way where it's like, uh, like victim narrative, right? Like helplessness, promoting helplessness, hopelessness, or like a need to be saved, right? Um, oh, we need you guys to save us or whatever, or like asking people for, for to do things for you in that way. And I think there's a way to do it that is empowering and about ownership and about, um, it's about like, you know, recognizing, you know, people always talk about like, oh, you got to have a warrior's mentality or whatever. Well, part of the warrior's mentality is knowing who your enemy is, right? And what they want out of you and what they want to do to you, right? I think we talk about Islamophobia. And also, I think the other problem, you know, before I get into it, is restricting the, con the topic of Islamophobia to American soil, right? And I think that the real ramifications of Islamophobia is you know, extends far beyond American soil and how I'm treated by individuals in society or how you're treated by individuals in society or like that if I can't get a job or you can't get a job or whatever. I think it has to do also with the fact that these narratives, these, uh, you know, characterizations have real, real impact and uh, on our brothers and sisters overseas who suffer the brunt of Islamophobia, right? Um, and that is why you see like, Zionist organizations, um, you know, the UAE, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, even like Arab dictators that invest into 
like the Islamophobic narratives and the Islamophobia industry. Um, Zionists specifically, they do so through financially, right? And I think we need to talk about Islamophobia as like an institutional systemic problem, a finance has a financial, uh, you know, network. It has like a governmental, you know, policy behind it, backing it, empowering it. I think also we need to like define what we mean by Islamophobia, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so here's one thing I was just thinking about this while listening to what you guys were saying. When I when, when I think of Islamophobia, I'm thinking predominantly within the North American context because we live here, right? And so. I could be guilty of that, but what I've understood is that uh, a lot of the talk about Islamophobia comes out from usually left-leaning people, right, who are non-Muslims, right? And what I'm afraid of is that the left oftentimes uses statements like this and uh, rallying cries like this to play into identity politics. And they'll say, okay, you Muslims have the right to blame your failures or, or, or uh, your lack of achievement on Islamophobia because people just hate Muslims. And it's kind of like, I feel like what um, some of the Jews do with, uh, with anti-Semitism, everything be, gets labeled anti-Semitism, everything is anti-Jew. And even uh, some people who are in the African-American communities where everything is blamed on the white man, right? I mean, you have these movements and I feel like that people, it's very dangerous because what happens is that when you actually have a real victim of Islamophobia, uh, it kind of, uh, you know, it, 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 people are desensitized to it. If I call everything Islamophobia, when it really happens, people are not as enraged about it as they should be because people are just throwing that term around. You, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's, yeah. the problem is that we, uh, it, it, in my mind, it actually does injustice to the actual people who really do suffer that Islamophobia. And that's mm-hmm. the, one, the one thing. And then the other thing is that, just for example, on that video that we were talking about, uh, it went on Twitter and I saw somebody tweeting it out on Twitter and saying, here's a person's Instagram, here's this girl's Instagram, here's her Facebook page, you know, do your thing, Twitter. And I responded saying, listen, why would you do anything on Twitter? I mean, the, the authorities are involved. Uh, why become emotional, right? I mean, nobody knows the insides of it, what happened, right? But what, what's that, what, what are you guys going to do? What are grown men going to do, like, you know, adults that are 30 years old? Are they going to harass some, like, you know, 15-year-olds t- you know what I mean? Like a uh, high school student who's immature and stupid. I mean, I-, I think that what happens is this leads Muslims to become a little bit more emotional and less logical. And then you see all these responses, right? People screaming out, oh, do this, do that. And I think we need to kind of calm that down a little bit yeah. and look at situations and say, hey, is this really Islamophobia? Or is it just, a, a, you know, just a, a, a beef between two people who, you know, that, that escalated and, and, and then maybe, you know, we can kind of separate that, you know, where, whereas... You know, for example, people like Chapel Hill, which is completely different. We know that a man was stalking a Muslim family, right? So we can clearly define it too. But if you yeah. muddy the water and mix them together, then it kind of loses that impact. I, I want to make sure because there's a lot of people in the in the chat who are commenting about this. We're not saying it doesn't exist, but overblowing an issue, you know, and making it bigger than it actually is, is something disingenuous. Uh, my wife is from Arkansas. She's from the deep <sighs> south, and the, there's. She was wearing. She started wearing hijab after nine eleven, or after nine eleven, yeah. And so, sorry, she started wearing hijab much before that. But she grew <laughs> up over there, and we've been down to the south several times wearing hijab. My my parents, my mom, my sister, they've been treated with nothing but respect and generosity, like like much more actually than the north. And there's this like narrative that's being played over and over again that the, the South is racist and it's not. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it's getting overblown to the to the extent that when I was going there, I was super nervous and I felt like I'm going to get killed at um, any gas station that I stop at when I'm <laughs> refilling. <laughs> like I was literally, I thought like I was scared of my own shadow. You're programmed, yeah. You know, and, and I think that's like a, an unhealthy... And I think what we're trying to say is, dude, is uh, just because something happens to somebody that happens to be Muslim, they get in an argument, like Mort was saying, they get, even if they get in a fight with somebody, it doesn't mean that it was because of Islamophobia. It could have been that either side was just a jerk. It had nothing to do with Islam, had nothing to do with the religion of the person. And that happens many off, we see many, you know, many instances where somebody gets in an argument or a fight 
with somebody that's wearing a scarf and they yeah. just call it Islam. They just see it online. They just label Islamophobia, make it go viral. So we're not saying it doesn't exist. Islamophobia exists, right? So, but we can't make everything that happens to a Muslim into Islamophobia, right? It's not fair. But what Hussam uh, is talking about is moving the focus away from that yes. to talking about an institutional Islamophobia that that is being per perpetuated and not being talked about. That's a deeper level, and that's what yeah. we appreciate about you. Let's talk about a much deeper level. So, Hassan, an um, example of that would be like what, like spying in the masjid, like those kind of programs, like oh, yeah, CVE, CVE, um, okay, one entire you briefly, narrative. briefly tell the listeners what CVE is. Just so, okay, wait, wait. so just to, okay, I'll talk to them. Okay, just really yeah. briefly. Okay, so because I know CVE, a lot of listeners do know, but then we have a new YouTube know, okay, audience yeah. as well. So. CVE is a program called Countering Violent Extremism. I believe Trump wanted to change it to Countering Violent Islamic Extremism, which is more accurate anyways. The whole program's premise is that um, they're, claim, they're claiming that the program's goal is to reduce extremism, right? Now, the problem is that their whole target is firstly the Muslim community. Like, that's their primary target. And the way they're countering extremism, or first of all, how do they define extremism, you know? Any of us here could be labeled extremists, right? The fact that I care about Syria and Palestine is, and the fact that I, you know, have some semblance or awareness of Islam as my deen, and like I have a strong sense of justice and injustice while having a strong connection to Islam, that's enough to be labeled an extremist, according to like, if you look at some of their measures, right? You look at some of like the UN's measures when they do their, their things, right? Like, if you look at some of their character profiles of what an extremist looks like, any of us can fit into that category. So it's so it's so poorly defined, firstly. Secondly, the focus is on ideology, ideological issues, um, which again creates this dynamic where Islam is the problem, right, of extremism. Um, so then it's perpetuating that narrative as well. Now, the third thing that it does is that it demands that uh, people um, basically spy on Muslims, right, and be suspicious of them by default where it trains teachers, psychiatrists, uh, you know, any service provider of some of any of some sort, like, um, you know, a help, like to provide some benefit uh, of some sort that you're supposed to have like a, a like a client, you know, uh, whatever relationship with. Right. Um, to For them oh, to be looking out for signs of extremism and then reporting it to the police and then you get sent to like a re-education program or even worse you can go to jail right um and basically this, this program is sought is seeking to pacify islam because they recognize islam as a dangerous mobilizing uh, as a as a religion that can mobilize people to to do actions right to do um actions against empire right um and this program is not restricted to the u.s it's global it's, it's, the goal is to globalize it so you have countries like France involved. You have countries like the UK with Prevent. You know, yeah. uh, a lot. Of, it takes a lot from Prevent. Well, Hussam, uh, we have we're having egregious incidences like what's happening in uh, East Turkestan, China. Exactly yeah. right. And, and so that, that's, that's why isn't Muslim leaders? At the, I'm talking about community leaders, leaders of of institutions, and why are why is everyone having a difficult time? Even at least, you know, you talking about Islamophobia. In, in the respect to what's going on in China, like, what's where's the disconnect here? Why is it so that everything is only about local issues, about local yeah. Islamophobia? Think everything, everything related to Muslims um, or all commentary related to Muslims will be only focused to what happens within our borders. It's kind yeah. of getting ridiculous. Yeah, so this is actually something Raja, who was on here last week, or I think, uh, or two weeks ago, I remember, yeah. um, talks about, uh, he calls it the good, bad Muslim, right? So like usually there's this dynamic between good Muslim and bad Muslim, where bad Muslim is political Muslim. Good Muslim is like, oh, I'm pro, I'm a patriot, right? I'm a patriot American. I love America. I love this. I love that. And they have no issues, you know, with Israel, yada, 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 right? Like that's a good Muslim. And there's like this new dynamic of a good, bad Muslim where if you're a bad Muslim, like you you counter, you're like pushing back against the government, but you're still within the accepted framework, the acceptable framework, right? So like you can talk about Islamophobia in the US, but like if you start trying to connect Muslims beyond national boundaries, 
that's when you start going overboard, right? Like that's when it starts becoming a problem. And so what you've had is like activists, like, you know, Alinda Sosu, right? Uh, you know, I would consider like a good, bad Muslim, right? Where she'll say things like, a jihad, our jihad is uh, to speak out against Trump, right? And like completely redefine what jihad is, you know, beyond that, right? Like where jihad is also the Uyghurs fighting against the Chinese government, right? Like yeah. that's a jihad that you should support. Um, or like in Syria, right? Um, and so what you have is these people now, their focus is solely on, before we talk about people overseas, we need to talk about us here at home, right? Like that's, you, that's something you hear Linda say a lot, for example, right? That's actually a narrative that's starting to become a lot more common. And this is, again, this works in favor of programs like CVE, of Zionist uh, attempts to disfra- disenfranchise the Muslim population from the broader Muslim community, right? And this and and distance Islam, uh, and and cult and make Islam into like the, an American Islam, an Egyptian Islam, a Palestinian Islam, where everybody fends for themselves, and you basically fit and assimilate into the nation state model, right? Um, and basically, you lose that connection to Muslims overseas. That's why. Uh, additionally, you're starting to see Muslims nowadays even distance themselves from Palestine, right? And talk about, oh yeah, Palestinians should do, uh, you know, they have their own thing. We need to focus on ourselves, yada yada yada, right? And like now you have these like national nationalistic divisions that are going on where people are not connecting to the Ummah on a broader level, and yeah. that's starting to be called Islamism, right? Well, Ummatism, right? You, what you uh, what you said about Linda was. was... See, what she did was actually something um, I respected in the sense that she made uh, public about, you know, making jihad, the jihad of the tongue, right? When you give yeah. advice to a ruler by your tongue. Yeah. And I thought that was great. But the problem is, is that you did it because you had support with the liberal audience. You didn't do it when Obama was doing his drone attacks on, on yeah. Yemen and across the world. You yeah. did it when it was politically convenient to do it. And that's yeah. what, what bothers me about the Muslim leadership in across the world right now, whether it's, yeah. it's, it's on a political level or on an organizational level. We're all just waiting to ride the wave of the next um, the, the, the next trend or the next uh, news, yeah. or, or news item that, w- that we can actually kind of get some support with. And um, that's why we need to connect all of these issues, right? Like even like with the UAE peace conference, for example, right? Like these, all of these issues are interconnected, right? Cause the attempt is to distance, to weaken Islam as a mobilizing theology, right? As a theology that mobilizes people towards action as a theology that promotes, you know, a, a support system amongst Muslims globally, because that threatens power, that threatens Western hegemony, right? And so, you know, the Linda's, whether they're in consciously or unconsciously doing so, right, and to unintentionally doing so, they're all they all con- contribute to this, you know, Islamophobia, Zionism, all this stuff. It's all con- contributing to this one goal, right? To this one end goal, end goal where we just have a fractured Muslim, a co- fractured concept of a Muslim community where we're just restricted to us here. Right. And I think another uh, clarification, you know, something to think about. It may sound a little basic or elementary. Um, when Western powers or powers in general, imperial powers, if you want to say, see a threat, whether it's religious or not religious, it needs to be weakened and eventually wither away, right? Yeah. So is it safe to say that Western powers, their hate isn't specifically for Islam, per se? It's something that's going to jeopardize its security. Like, do you think that they sit around and think that, hey, Islam is evil, or like, hey, this thing which is called Islam is growing, and we need to, to, to a certain level, that's threatening our power. That's a great point. You know what I'm saying? Well, well, I, was Cause thinking, I think that'll solve a lot of Islamophobia issues, too. Yeah, because I was yeah. thinking, like, are they just playing, for example, the, the whole Middle Eastern uh, politics, right? The Whether it's Israel, Iran, or everything, and the way the military-industrial complex looks at yeah. all these events happening, they're like, man, this is a great way to keep generating money and it's keep selling these guys arms. And are they really looking at, 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 at us exactly. from from an Islam aspect? Or are they just saying like, hey, th- these guys don't like each other. We, we don't care about what their belief is. 
exactly. It's, it just seems like they will they'll never agree with each other, and we can keep selling them arms. Because look at Saudi Arabia, dude. No, Saudi Arabia does more beheadings I, than ISIS no, did, but America. Why? No, I disagree why? completely, and I'll tell you why. There's open think tanks that advise the government, and they are openly saying it's a battle of hearts and minds. They know they're in the process of defining what an acceptable Muslim is and what is an unacceptable yeah. Muslim. But is that for the sake of it being Islam? Is it like that's okay. the wolf so in sheep's clothing, or is it because their own, their, their own existence? Because so, they know right now there's been there have been there have been many philosophers and, and, and historians that are saying, listen, we've seen this cycle go back and forth in history, and right now the only two types of systems that are going to survive in the future are either this secular system or Islam. One of the two. It's going to be. It's coming down to one of these two ideas, right? And so they're they're and and think tanks know that, and so they're very they're they're extremely and the government who work with them are also aware of that fact, and they're extremely concerned at the fact that you see when Islam came into the world, it didn't just come in because of swords and stuff. It was an ideology that spread across Europe. Yeah. It spread across. Asia, it spread across the entire world. Even the Mongols began adopting Islam, right? And so you have to understand how powerful that ideology is. Yeah. It doesn't unite people based on, on color of skin, on your politics. No, it unites them based on a common belief in a God, right? Which yeah. is something that was, sure, we've had infighting and stuff like that, but no other religion has seen such uh, homogeny as Islam has um, for a longer period of time. And I think they've realized that there's a reason why you know, what the most recent Muslim empire, the Ottoman Empire, lasted for 900 years. There's a reason, you know, I mean, and I think that what, what, what happened is right now is they don't want to see um, a, a revival of that. And I think what they fear is that if Muslims have their identity, if they, it, right now they can see also that there are Muslims that are awakening back up and what they're trying to do is have a controlled demolition. They're saying, well, let's, 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 um, let's fix that nar- na- that narrative and say, well, if you want to be a, an orthodox Muslim, you should be like this. And if you want to be a, you know, if you're an ex- a fundamentalist, if you believe in this, and this goes back to what but Hassan was more, saying. I'll let you continue. Just be more specific, because a lot of times you say they. When you say <laughs> that they want this to happen, who are we speaking about and specifically? Are we talking about people the federal? People who want to maintain power. The colonizers. Yeah, okay. the con- no, no, I understand honest. that, but who? Because, for instance, okay. there's a lot of confusion where people of what the right wing are, they're not really involved in the government, but they're pushing stuff and it catches traction. Then you have the federal government that actually wants something to happen. Then you have the CIA that's involved okay. in... This, this so is, who, is, who are the, the they? US. Just to make but it clear for people. The US. This is anybody that wants to remain in power. If you look at even governments in the Middle East, you look at governments in Africa, you look at in America... People who want to maintain power, they don't want something like, uh, uh, um, you know, Muslims who are in that region to unify under certain principles. So they, what they want to do is essentially is they want to control this um, this uprising. What they'll do is they'll say, and this is just to go back to Hassan's point, and, and I'll, I'll let him explain a, a little bit of this. But even if, um, for example, the classification of what is an extremist, do you know that the Rand Institute? Um, or even the Pew Research, they quoted something saying that if you read Kitab al-Tawheed ever in your life, you are an extremist. A book that has nothing to do with jihad, nothing to do with anything. It's simply talking about Tawheed. But if you have read that book, you are following the category of extremism. I think they so said the reason why that? they said that is because the Kitab al-Tawheed is what a lot of Salafists or Wahhabis refer to, right? It's fine, I think but the, the material itself, that. but there's so many people who have read that book that are not Salafists. I mean, there are people who just casually read that book online. I mean, it, dude, there are people who read. I mean, it, the book is literally just a bullet point of ideas about the hate, literally. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the belief so, in God. So yeah, yeah. So go ahead, I mean, Hassan. Yeah, Hassan can can further elaborate on that, but I think this is the problem. I, I think um, I think with your with regards to the question about you know, does the U.S. does you know it's not just Western powers, by the way. You know, Eastern powers as well. The, do they have an issue with Islam as an ideology? Does the world have an issue with Islam, Islam as an ideology? So I think, at least within the U.S. context, um, before Islam became like the main focus of opposition, it was you know communism, right? And the reason why communism was a threat was because the USSR was a legitimate superpower that could compete with the U.S., right? Um, and in the U.S.'s mind and then their foreign policy, you know, thinking the U.S. can be the only civilization 
that exists and no other civilization can exist alongside of it even though throughout history there have been multiple civilizations existing at the same time right multiple powers existing at the same time right but the us wants to remain an uncontested superpower and part of that uncontested superpower is to make sure there is no other superpower that rises above it even if the us is failing as long as the us nothing else comes to replace it the us as long it doesn't matter how much it fails it can still stay the, at the peak of power right so that's why it doesn't matter no matter what financial crisis occurs no matter what this what that this is why they invest so much in the military right to maintain this is why they have so many american bases around the world right this is why they have so many aircraft carriers because they can uh, assert their power no matter what right um i think that you know post cold war we need to look at you know you know I, before the cold war and all that stuff during colonialism, Islam did play a pivotal role in resisting colonialism, right? Whether it was Sufi Islam, you know, there were, there were, you know, the people part of Tariqas, they were fighting against colonialism, for example, right? Um, uh, like Omar Muhtar in Libya, right? Um, and then you have, you know, afterwards, you had like the resistance efforts. A lot of the resistance efforts were more so Arab nationalism or some national effort, right? And so Islam wasn't really a big thing back then right like in terms of as a mobilizing resistance effort after the initial stages of colonialism now then you had the rise of then you had like people like say Kut, um, Hassan um, um, and then you had you know I think a very pivotal point that people need to look at more is Algeria right the Algerian resistance against the French yeah now what was interesting about the Algerian resistance against the French is that Yes, they had a lot of, you know, national calls against the French or whatever. You're talking about lot. the F- FLN, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about, you know, like, you ever seen the Battle of Algiers, right? right? Like, that whole thing, right? Like, the whole resistance movement against the French that, you know, with the ter- with whatever, the terrorism, with the bombing, with the, you know, women with a hijab going inside, pretending to be French, dropping a bomb, and, and then leaving, whatever, right? It was a whole national, you know, effort. The thing is that a lot of, you know, Marxist analysts miss this, right? Um, when they analyze put things like Algeria, because they don't see ideology or religion as a mobilizing tool, and they only see things through a material lens, right? For example, but what happened in Algeria was that the French tried to do a, something called uh, unveiling the the Algerian woman, right? And what they meant, what this meant, was unveiling, you know, the hijab, literally, like liberalizing them. But also unveiling them on a morale level, because they realized that the women of Algeria were the morale of the movement, right? They're the ones who, you know, while the men were fighting, they're the ones who were raising the next generation, they're the ones who were giving them, educating them, they're the ones who were, you know, providing that support system for the men to be able to fight, right? And so unveiling had to do with unveiling them at their homes and outside, right? Now, Algerians resisted that a lot of it was through Islam, right? It was through an Islamic, you know, you know. Uh, uh, Islamic identification, and the French failed miserably. Right? They they suffered so many losses. Right? Um, and they were kicked out of Algeria. They were humiliated. The U.S. We need to understand this about colonization, about colonizers. Right? And the U.S. is a colonizing force. It just uses soft power more, but it still has hard power, hard military power as well. Um, the U.S. obviously learns from this. Right? Colonizers adapt, and they've learned also that Islam as a tool of mobilization is dangerous, right? It is extremely dangerous to them as, as world powers. Another instance you could look at is Afghanistan, right? The Mujahideen in Afghanistan were from all over the world, right? And they came and fought the USSR and they defeated the USSR. The US supported them because, you know, they had a shared goal of defeating the USSR, but, you know, they come to realize that actually, you know, the Mujahideen were not, you know, on the US side either necessarily, right? And then, so you have like these movements that come up through Islamic an Islamic movement that literally results in like uh, you know uh, a physical resistance. Couple that with the ideology of Islam, you know, of Tawhid, right? Like Tawhid is really important. Um, you know, people shouldn't underestimate it. But the belief of one God and His law is the law, and only His his uh, pleasure is what's sought is dangerous to these people because they want you to surrender to their power and their state. But when you believe in Allah, for example, and you have such 
strong connection to Allah or you or you are conscious of his power, then nothing and you know nothing can harm you without his will, then you can't be scared into anything. You can't be you can't be made to cower in front of anyone, right? In front of any man, in front of any state, right? And that's why you see anytime there's a Muslim population that whether it's China, whether it's Israel, whether it's in Egypt or wherever in the U.S., they always target the concept of, um, you know, uh, dedication to Islam on the Sharia level, right? On, uh, to Sharia, right? Because that implies uh, submission to Allah and not submission to anything outside of that system. That's why they always, always attack Islam. That's why they always attack, you know, they always try to. Uh, reduce your connection to god as the sole source of morality as your sole source of motivation right as your sole source of connection that's why they always try to push patriotism or you know in china what they do is they even like put statues where the where the uyghurs live right in east Turkestan, they put statues of mao or they put statues of wherever like idols literally right right to to you know it's a it's a means of like you know trying to shift the culture right or, or demoralize people as well. And right? not only that, just a stamp of, hey, we're, you know, you're under our control. Yeah. Don't forget yeah. where your loyalty should be, you know. And Israel, and this is why Israel funds Islamophobia and funds these liberalizing aspects of, uh, the, these liberalizing attempts of Islam, of like promoting LGBT stuff, of, you know, distancing Muslims from, you know, quote, unquote, Islam. I don't like the word Islamism, right? If you believe in Sharia, you're an Islamist, according to governments, right? If you believe in a Sharia, you believe in the fact that, Allah's laws uh, pr- supersede any other laws, then you're considered an Islamist. That's it doesn't true. matter whether yeah. you're Ikhwan or Hizb al Tahrir or you know, Jamaat al Islamiyyah, it doesn't matter who you are. If you believe in that, then you're an Islamist, according to these people, right? And they were dangerous, right? Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so that's why you have like countries like Israel so invested in you know, Islamophobia networks, right? Because they recognize, you know, that the resistance of the Palestinian people in China, they recognize that the resistance of the Uyghurs really does hinge on their connection to Islam, right? Um, even even in Palestine, when the Marxists were like really the prominent resistance force, before they would go do their suicide bombings, they would pray, right? Even though they would say what they would say they're atheists, they would pray, right? Right before they would go do their suicide bombings, right? Um, and so this this connection to the deen, they don't understand it. They don't understand why we put such precedence to Allah over them. And it like, and so it they're so obsessed crazy. with trying to destroy it, right? Well, well, and they you, can't. They'll never destroy it, right? In, in relation to the recent UAE peace conference, yeah. What, uh, what do you think is? How do you think Islamophobia ties into that? Do you, or is so, there even a connection? Of course, there's a connection. Um, I, th- I think like I think I define Islamophobia, like I said, as the attempt to change. I, I think it's to, the attempt to fundamentally alter Islam through uh, fear mongering, or through you know soft, uh, soft power or whatever, right? Um, with regards to foreign, this is domestically foreign affairs. Obviously, is more hard power, you know, militarism. Um, but there's a big propaganda wing to Islamism. Part of this, a part of uh, to Islamophobia. Part of this propaganda wing is involving Muslim countries, right? Where they claim like they're, you know, they're practicing Muslims, they accept Islam. Like, how can you accuse them of not caring about Islam? But at the same time, they're undermining the deen, right? Right, on several different levels. Um, this UAE peace conference, I mean, you could see just by the names the people who were invited, right? Like Sarah Khan, uh, you had uh, Edward Hussein uh, from uh, Quilliam Foundation, you had. Uh, Clear, you had the ADL. Clear, clear Islamophobes that even, you know, our community Zionist leaders would agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, actually, I think, I don't want to get to, because I think it's been talked about a lot. I think Dr. Shetty has gone over it. I think Roger's episode was really good on it. Yeah. What I do think is important now is for scholars, in the U.S. at least, because I think this issue in the U.S. is becoming a really deep problem, right? This issue of just excusing anything any scholar does because they're a scholar. Um are excusing you know all these things hustle done yada 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 well no you have to take a you have to recognize who your enemies are and what they're trying to do you have to take a stand in that situation this is what i mean by knowing your enemies right knowing what their goals are so you don't fall into their trap this hustle done stuff does not help islam in the long in the long run right 
being distracted by intentions does not help Islam in the long run. And does not help Muslims in America in particular, right? What they need to do is they come out with a statement. I think, I'm hoping, scholars can come out with a statement. I know some brothers working on this, right? On trying to get this done. Um, decrying the UAE Peace Conference, but conferences like it in general, right? So that it becomes a standard, it becomes a precedent set from now on that this is not considered acceptable by the scholars in America, right? And so when somebody says, oh, what's your delete? What's your basis for saying this? Yada, yada, you have something you can go back to, right? And there's a lot of scholars who are against this, but it's not as powerful when each one comes out individually as opposed to they all come out with the same. Imagine that with like a hundred scholars signed on to it, big names or whoever, right? Like that's a lot stronger. And also it can pressure the likes of Hamza Yusuf to stop his, you know, affiliations, you know, whatever his intentions are, right? No, it's it's yeah. a story that's not as spicy as Noman Ali Khan. So they don't yeah. all sign up on uh, and issue a joint <laughs> statement against the poor guy, you know? That's a good observation, actually. I mean, th th that says something about the, the way our brain is as a community. It's just... Like, where are your priorities? You, you've, you've all managed to write, like, joint statements uh, either in support of him or either against him, but regarding something as clear-cut as the UAE issue, I mean, how... Or not... I mean, it, or anything in, in terms of organized Islamophobia f uh, from a, a governmental level, you know? How could you... You know, how, how could you not come out with some statement like, hey, you know... We as as the as the leaders or scholars or or people who uh, have you who you have given or entrusted Trust. us with to give you any kind of guidance, we we unanimously come with the statement saying that any kind of um, relationship with oppressive regimes in the world is not acceptable. It's not that hard. Yeah. I think I think with No Man is like it was one person, right? I think the issue with the UAE Peace Conference is so many um all them out who went, right? So many big names too, like that people some of them are their teachers. Well, Sam, right? even let's just leave the the UAE issue yeah. alone because maybe Hamza Yusuf is just too big yeah. to take down. I'm not even forget about that, you yeah. know? Yeah. It's just, it just but in terms of a general statement. Yeah, I think like like hey, this is are, these are our brothers that we're going to stand with unanimously. Salman Aloda, you know, and, and th these brothers yeah. are rotting in jail. Like, how could you yeah. not how make yeah. a unanimous statement yeah, against him? Like, 100% agreed. 100%. I think the other thing is this, uh, an interesting point. Like, uh, they feel like they're choosing between Hassan Dullet and then also, um, <laughs> you know, and then condemnation, right? I don't think you have to choose between either or. I think you can incorporate both. You can say, hey, look. Maybe this person was mistaken. We don't assume bad about him, but regardless, that statement is incorrect. Well, or more, the, more, we, we have more what that with them is incorrect, right? You shouldn't just be like, okay, you know what? I'm siding with you. No, we can say, look, we can assume the brother maybe made a mistaken judgment or maybe didn't realize everything or whatever it may be. Maybe everything wasn't um, presented to him or maybe he was coerced. We don't know. I, I, I think time, we can still say, hey, the action is wrong. You know, meeting with these kinds of or mingling with these kinds of people and endorsing them is wrong because of what they've done, and we cannot excuse that. Well, luckily we have a scholar here who can tell us <laughs> what, what's actually going in their mind. Well, what are different factors going on in their mind? Why wouldn't yeah, they come out yeah. with a statement like this, Sheikh Amr? He's silent as usual, like all the rest of them. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead, Alex. He's just giving me a hard time. We're all <laughs> friends. So for anyone new to the podcast, we kind of break each other's. Yeah, so when you, <laughs> when you just give it a little more direction, when you, when you mean who's silent about what? No, I'm talking about so, creating a joint so statement let, let against just... oppressive regimes who are, you know, uh, for example, the situation with Salman yeah. Oda. Yeah, I, I think uh, I th sometimes we overthink why scholars do what they do. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of insight. And you guys already know this. It's just um, there's, uh, there's many uh, uh, faces to this issue. The first thing is that this is our opportunity. Islam has been on the back burner for a long time. This is our opportunity. Uh, to bring about issues or at least join with power and indirectly we can do certain things behind the scenes or and that's what those are a lot of the reasons that um, are given to oh we don't agree with this at all and we saw that growing up right um, when people getting involved uh, with certain political processes or whatever like no 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 we, we know that 
this may be wrong, but we're doing it for the greater good or the lesser of the two evils thing. So that's that's a, a, a surface level thing. The second thing is that sometimes scholars see that their uh, higher up scholars are doing something they follow without questioning. Right. That's yeah. one. That's one thing. It's, it's a it's a respect thing, and uh, they get blinded by everything else around them, of what's actually happening, the reality of something, and. Obviously, there's coercion. We don't know if that's even the situation here. That's a possibility, too, right? But there's one that's very, very important that we have to understand, right? And I think that this is uh, this may be a little unsettling for certain people, is that scholars in the past and in the present were disassociated from the understanding of what the political arena actually is. Yes, that's 100%. Intentionally, in the books, of, of, of fiqh that are actually supposed to be talking you know there's a dilemma when it's only activists are talking about the oppression right when only activists are talking the, the problem with that is and just let me lean back a little bit any type of organization or any masjid that just starts up I was just talking to masjid recently and they're just starting up their new program I said there's three things that have to be started if you're really really concerned about the youth and the people right off the bat right the first thing is masjid, uh, 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 you know, uh, activities and bringing about contemporary issues for the youth. But that's not enough because that's going to give them certain type of activism without knowledge, which can eventually lead to misunderstandings of Islam or even if you want to call it, you know, uh, extremism, even though I don't like using that word that much. But for example's sake. So then you need to add something else to it, which is... Knowledge, they need to have a knowledge base. Even if it's very, very elementary, they need to understand the culture of knowledge. And the third portion is that they need to have an open-door policy where youth and elders can come and talk about social issues. These yeah. three things have to be all met at the same time, right? And encouraged uh, 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 at the same level. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that being said, what happens uh, uh, in the past and in the present as far as Islamic knowledge is concerned is that political issues of the reality of what's happening is kind of put on the back burner and everything is taught theoretical, theoretical, theoretical. And even among specialists, fiqh is taught on such a theoretical, literary, uh, uh, you know, in, in a literal sense, that there's certain applications of fiqh that are done upon the general you know, populace of people, which are not meant to be even discussed amongst the general populace of the people. Right. And then there becomes this whole like taboo issue of, you know what, we don't know anything about politics. Leave it up to those people who are responsible for politics. And we're just going to follow whatever they tell us to do, which is actually not supposed to happen with jurists. Right. If you really rethink really about it, a Muslim jurist is actually a lawyer and potentially yeah. a judge. That's what it is. Right. A, a, someone who's a faqih is actually a lawyer who's meant to be in a courtroom discussing issues, whether it's on a personal level with, an, with somebody that you're defending. Right. It just like it's like any other courtroom. So I, I think. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Are you done? Uh, or, no, I'm, but, sorry, but, sorry, no, we can add more to it. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. You can finish. That. So, so what I'm saying is now that uh, a majority of of scholars, because their training had nothing to do with politics, even though politics has a huge, actually more than Salah Zakat Soman Hajj, which is like this much as far as the compendium of fiqh is concerned, compared to like this much, right? So if you have a compendium of like 20 volumes of fiqh, of legal of legal dicta, only one volume of that or two is going to be a salah zakat so much hajj, then what's everything else? What are the remaining 18 volumes that nobody is discussing and is only theoretical within the classrooms, right? And that comes back to a lot of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, powers and in, in, in politics and how scholars were meant not to discuss that. And I'll give you a small example. I've discussed it on the podcast before. After the Arab Spring, there's this, there was a whole new, like almost revamping uh, of content, which was being discussed politically in, in our fifth classes in Egypt. Before that, it was, you know, it's kind of understood, but kind of almost like in code words and just kind of go research this book. But then people were talking very, very openly because it was almost like it, there was no, uh, uh, we were exempt from any laws at that uh, yeah. at that time, you know? So um, from everything that I've mentioned, a lot of it has to do with the incompetency of scholars uh, as far as what's actually happening in the world. 
and it's actually looked down upon. And I'll, I'll give you a, a small example um, of uh, what I was researching about Imam Samar Qandi and Hamza Yusuf happened to be talking about it, right? And he was mentioning that the three people that are the biggest people of mischief are those who give out news, those who listen to the news, something to that extent, and those who are uh, 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 the spreaders of news, basically. And what that did is it kind of gives you the understanding of, hey, you know what? What's happening in the news, that's for the common folk. That's yeah. what's happening in this world. We're not. That's not our specialty. We're just going to be with our books and discuss. And there's there's a good part to that too, but I'll, there's a dangerous part, which all of you are now uh, understanding, I think. The, the dangerous part to that is you have no idea of the reality around you, which is going to hinder the legal judgments that you're going to pass, right? Uh, the benefit where, from their point of view to that is that uh, we have to uh, help the people on an individual level. We have to teach them their deen. And we just end up being teachers, but we don't end up being really leaders. Yeah. And the leadership of somebody who's a scholar completely goes away, and you just end up being a teacher, which is great. But you you, you got to be multidimensioned, right? Yeah. And you just think of it as something individual, and you just kind of go to the side, and you become powerless. And I think that's what's happening. And it becomes very enticing when you get invited by a world power now. Right. Let's fast forward to what happened in the UAE. Now a world power is inviting you. The stage is yours. And like, hey, I've been working my whole life to get here. Now I can, you know, side with power and eventually, even if I could help on a molecular weight. But that's very dangerous, right? Your molecular weight is actually not going to do anything. Forget about Islam and haram and all that stuff. We'll discuss that later. But in the grand scheme of things, of all the stuff that UAE, UAE did and Saudi did, do you think you going on a stage now is actually helping something or you're being used to fix the uh, the reputation that you have? You know what I'm saying? Or to yeah. recruit people against this anti-terrorism thing of what it is also embedded in. You know, what's embedded in this is that, you know, you're either with us who are moderate Muslims or you're against us and you're Wahhabi Muslims, for instance, right? Yeah. I think um, it's interesting that... Um, First of all, Jazakallah for your input, uh, Sheikh. You know, it's really valuable to get insight into actual people who studied and know what's like explicitly how the, you know, teaching operates in, you know, in the uh, Islamic uh, education system, wherever, right? I think um, this, all of this ties back to like everything we've been talking about, right? Like this is by design, this attempt to, you know, distance scholars from like political realities, right? Because like I said in the past, we've had scholars who are the ones who are actively fighting against like the colonizers, right? Who are invoking Islam as a means to justify the resistance against colonizers, right? And so now you needed to create a backdrop of scholars or a general scholarly class that sees politics as beneath them, right? And this is the problem, right? Is what is politics, right? How are we defining politics? Because being a Muslim in this world, in a world of nation states and a globalized world right where the u.s is supreme and where the we have institutions like the u.n the imf you know where it forces you know interest on countries economies right and it forces certain banking practices um the u.n which enforces certain you know uh like cultural practices to using you use it taking advantage of aid right to to force uh certain countries to conform to certain standards on you know issues like abortion or sex or whatever right are on, on social norms. Um, and the U.S. obviously through its hard power, soft power, etc. When we live in that world, when you're a Muslim who believes in Allah's oneness, who believes in Allah as a supreme you know, deity, as a supreme power, that your existence by design is political because yeah. that existence in and of itself, that submission to Allah in and of itself is a resistance against this current world order, right? And when the Prophet ﷺ came to uh, Quraysh, right, one of the things they feared wasn't just, you know, what one of the reasons why they feared Islam and monotheism was also because of how it hurt their power, right? How it hurt their business of idolatry and how they hurt, it hurt their elitism, elite class, right? I think That's that was at least 90% of it, as a minimum of 90%. It wasn't because he was a nice person. If Islam was only, and I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. I'm glad you touched upon this. If Islam was only about adab and akhlaq, why would they reject him? It's like, yeah. oh, he just wants to make people more nice. 
he exactly. wants to have manners. Is that really what they were rejecting? That he just calling everyone to be a nice person? It was yeah. actually not that at all. They loved him for being nice. But exactly. then what was it now that triggered them that, hey, there's something else besides the generosity and nice and akhlaq and all yeah. that stuff, right? Yeah, and, and, and you know, this is the thing is that, you know, when somebody says, you know, oh, politics is beneath us, like, that's a political statement. Like, if your it understanding is. of politics is restricted to governance, then yeah, okay, that might be accurate, like Democrat, Republican, or, you know, actually being in government. But like, you know... Right now, teaching Tawheed is political. That's a political action, so to speak, right? Because there's governments actively pushing against you doing that, right? Like yeah. you said, in Egypt, in Egypt, the problem with like in these in these countries to be apolitical as a scholar is that the country, the people, are, you're starting to see a big drop in practicing in Islam, practice of Islam, and a big reason for that is because of the government's initiatives to demonize yeah. Islam on a political level, yeah. right? And yeah. through, through culture, through shows, right? Like when the revolution happened, when Morsi was in power, there were shows, because he wasn't ever really in power, right? Yeah. There were shows coming out where anybody with a beard yeah. was being treated as an extremist in that show. If they pray, you're an extremist, right? Yeah. My cousin has been stopped like several times with when he was working with his friend, right? On, on the project together, because his friend had a big beard. They got like investigated and like interrogated before just because of that, right? And so when you have a government actively pushing against things that are sunnah, things that are inherent in Islam, you know, shutting down masajid, right? Like, they legit shut down masajid to pre they prevent sometimes uh, Jumu'ah Salah and, and some masajid, right? Um, or or, they, or they, they bar, you know, a certain number of people from entering, etc. Because they recognize that the deen, you know, they need to control what people know about the deen. Now, why do they need to do that, right? And that's the question a lot of these scholars need to ask is, you know, when I'm being taught, when I'm being told not to be political, who am I serving? Am I serving the population? If I'm just teaching them on an individual level, but I'm point, ignoring, and I'm ignoring the fact that the overall rest of society is actively pushing against that, right? That's the framework of the society itself. It's literally actively, how can I work on an individual level with people when beyond that two hours I spend with them, 22 hours of the day they're being bombarded with anti-islamic messages right and that's why you have prayer dropping so much in a country like egypt right that's why you have practice becoming so much worse and, and apostasy rising right and atheism rising it's because of the politics yeah. it's not just it's not just because people in, <laughs> internally they're evil or whatever no part of it is because there's an active uh, attempt to literally like propagandize and brainwash people into these ideas right and if scholars aid those governments in doing so, they legitimize those governments. And that also plays like a double effect where, okay, you're saying I'm working with the governments to spread Islam, but your affiliation with the governments is turning people off of Islam as well, right? I don't trust the scholars anymore. I don't take Islam from you guys anymore. I'm not going to take Islam. Religion is used to oppress us, right? And that's, that's how you get what we have now, right? Where there's like this clash between awam and ulama. And there's people like attacking all the other. This is how, right? And this isn't to say, actually, I think American scholars uh, are a lot less political than Arab scholars, many Arab scholars, for example, who would be in danger of some of the things they say. Because in the Arab countries, they do have very political fatawa sometimes, right? Yeah. They do have fatawa, you know, justifying revolution. They do have fatawa, um, for example, criminalizing even, you know, working with Zionists or talking with Zionists, saying it's haram to do so, right? To normalize oppression. You don't get that over here. You don't, you'll, they'll say it's wrong. They won't even say it's hot on to do so. Exactly. Right? Like, that's, that's the next thing I want to talk to because I think it'll segue more into your speciality. Is, um, you know, yesterday I was talking to my children <laughs> on the way to a nikah. You know, one of my cousins just got um, married last night. And uh, we were just talking about, you know, when Muslims say something is right or something is wrong. It's wrong. That's actually mean. That actually means something is, for instance, fard or something is haram. Haram. Yeah. That that's the way that Muslims, like I, I'm getting, I'm trying to get my children used to saying when they say something is right or wrong or if something's okay. Yeah. That that should be with the paradigm of Islam. You know, our our hierarchy, yeah. if you want to say, of all the way from fard to wajib to sunnah to makruh to haram, for instance, right? Um. So when we, even as, as, as adults now, when, we, when we're saying working with Zionists is wrong, 
are we saying it's wrong because we are uh, a part of a certain you know wing a right wing or left wing and saying that hey it's wrong of what they're doing the palestinians the palestinians are people too let's just say that's one narrative right or are we saying that it's completely haram for the existence of zionism in israel to exist in the middle east i don't even know if you these are your words i'm just giving an example right yeah, yeah. many muslims many many muslims understand that giving up a hand length a hand span of muslim land is considered haram yeah. right yeah but so it the, the the semantics are very important if you say yeah. working with zionists is wrong of what you've mentioned i'm glad you mentioned this then it can mean many things like you don't know what the person's paradigm yeah. here is that's why scholars need to be involved in exactly right? exactly but if you say it's haram to work with zionists it's much more difficult and again the next step i think the reason why it's much easier is um you know we we've we alhamdulillah no matter how much you complain of how much islamophobia is out here in, in yeah. the west dude we're living like kings man and an example of that is you know when sim told me that you're going to be on and you know you you you've uh discussed uh you know zionism in syria and you know and i i was kind of like guilty of it you're so used to looking up information online and looking up people's statuses and when i saw shirazi's thing on burma also i can understand why people don't want to even discuss the ummah's issues and i think this is a whole it's a much deeper problem on a different level too is that uh we're so uh complacent the way we live and we don't like anything impinging we don't want to bring any type of sadness in our lives because we just want to keep these dopamine levels high of us us just constantly going through all these different things on our phone and looking at cooking shows and looking at these you know quick one minute things of happiness or whatever the case is and uh there's something that creeps on you when you see the reality of the real world right and you start like oh you just kind of want to push it away because you don't want to deal with that feeling you know and i, I think, think I, i think it's it's just, it's just that <laughs> it checks us it checks like, us and we don't I want mean, to have that conversation with ourselves though we and you know what is that a lot of people want to say, you know what, oh, you know, we're perfect, we have all these things, but we have issues that we don't deal with. We're neglecting and, a big portion of, yeah. And I we feel like that if we, if we address those things, uh, I mean, that they somehow look negatively on us, and so we should just ignore them because, um, you know, we don't want a negative image. And, but, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, and you know, you know what the interesting thing is, is that um, you said, like, we live comfortably here, and I think... You know, as Muslims, we need to understand that nothing in Islam, you don't have a right to, you don't have a right from Allah. He doesn't have a promise to you that you will live comfortably on, on exactly. earth if you're a Muslim, right? Very true. My contention is that as Muslims in America, we can't live comfortably. You can't possibly live comfortably on a psychological level, knowing that your existence in America is contributing to the oppression of your Muslim brothers and sisters overseas. You not doing something here by default is you accepting and uh, allowing for the U.S. to oppress your brothers and sisters over here for your comfort. Me, I can't live in comfort here. I cannot be comfortable while living here. And I think that's a blessing. That's a blessing and a curse from Allah, right? Wait, can, can you redefine, uh, explain a little bit? Because, I mean, for example, I mean, there are people who will voice an opinion but that's all they can do. I mean, what uh, do you well, mean? yeah, obviously, what you can't. What well, you're able to do, what you have intelligence to do. But if you understand the politics, if you know the pol, you can't. And we should know because we need to understand what's attacking our community, right? And this is a thing. This is the thing that really bothered me about a lot of the quote unquote traditionalists or whatever who were defending the UAE peace conference or whatever was that many of them complained about the modernization and liberalization of Islam in America, but then contribute to that same paradigm. By separating politics from deen, as if in Islam we have a separation from our politics and our deen, from what we consider morally right is apparently different in politics than it is in deen. No, it's not. Our deen, our politics is defined should be defined by our deen, our, our morality, right? Or what's right and wrong in terms of on on moral decisions. So when you separate that, you're aiding in that secularization of Islam, right? And that's what really annoyed me because you're actually contributing to the modernization of Islam when you do that, like from those traditionalists. Yeah, I mean, I think I, think I just want to clarify one thing. I mean, for example, you know, many of us Muslims in this generation are born here, right, in this mm -hmm. country. So I, I think what the more important thing is that it, it is still patriotic for you to, to express um, 
issues with your government, with the yeah. way they handle policies and even foreign policy, domestic and foreign. It doesn't mean that, I mean, obviously everybody has a tie to a homeland of born in, right? I mean, most people who are in our age group probably have never been back home, never even yeah. have any relevance to it, right? This is their home, this is their culture. Um, and, and so I think that they need to separate and say, you know what, my thing is not about American society or people or my homeland, but it's more about holding my own government responsible for what they're doing and what do I do in terms of, you know, and how do I, how do I uh, uh, um, combat that? How do I fix that problem? Because if, 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 here's, my, here's my fear, Sam. If you raise a generation of people who think it's us versus them, right, in, in a way in America, um, that can be also very, very, very problematic. It, it's not in an us versus them way, but to understand in relation to America where you stand, right? In relation to American power, where Muslims stand, right? And to what extent can you be truly patriotic or to what extent can you truly ignore the fact that your existence here is coming at the expense of the existence you're, of you're, We're in a position of power, Hussam. I mean, yeah. we're the, the whole n narrative these days in um, a lot of the discourse is about what position of power you're in and, and yeah. all that. But when it comes to speaking out against the oppression of your fellow Muslims, you know, even your fellow scholars in the... Uh, in the Muslim world, you're that that whole language is uh, well, well, you know, that's politics, and we're not going to talk about it. That's that's not we don't want to cause fitna or something like that. But you you're enjoying the luxury at the expense of uh, you know your comp your oh, uh, so like the Muslim your colleagues Muslim your colleagues yeah, yeah. at the Muslim world, you know, I, and like not the, even not even like Muslims the overseas. Sorry, what was that? What about the Muslim one percenters? Is that what we are? I mean, in America? Maybe we are. But you mentioned, I think anyone living in this time is in the 1% of civilizations <laughs> of, of the world where we're in the best situation. But in terms of right now, I think in, in, the, in the Muslim world, we are in the best position of power where we can utilize. We're not, we're not calling for any kind of violence, right? We're talking about oppression that is being done. To our Muslim brothers and sisters across the at world, at the and, least, right? That's at the least what we should be right. doing, right? And and the thing is, it's not just even Muslims overseas. We have Muslims here who are still in prison, right? Yeah. For no reason, right? Like Afia Siddiqui, uh, she's not in prison here, but she's in prison because of the U.S., right? Right. Um, and, and the Pakistani government. Um, Tariq Mahanna, right, is another one. Um, so you have like, we have political prisoners here as well who. The Muslim community has completely abandoned. And you have non-Muslims fighting more for those Muslims than Muslims are fighting for them. They have more ghira for their brothers and sisters suffering than Muslims here. And they excuse it with, you know, alhamdulillah. This is why I hate when people say, alhamdulillah, uh, we're blessed to live in the U.S. No, honestly, it could be a blessing and it could be a curse because you could be asked about the fact that you had comfort here on the Day of Judgment. What did you do with your comfort? Right? What did you do for the Ummah? You knew what was going on. You did nothing about. It. You didn't even. Those people don't even give money, right? At, at like Muslims don't even give money to like some so like some of these causes. Now and then they're not speaking out as well. Of course you're going to be. Why wouldn't you be asked about that? Yeah. Right. You have raising the awareness too. A lot of it has to do with raising awareness too. It's so easy to raise awareness and and change people's minds. Even if you're in Chicago and you're online and on social media, you can change people's minds. On the other side of the world, you don't physically actually have to be there anymore. That and was a part of the internet, raised right? to make the world a smaller place. Exactly, and you know what? Because a lot of Muslims are afraid to speak out because, like I said, like I said, there's political prisoners, right? They're afraid to be speak to speak out because of punishment, right? And because there was surveillance and MSAs that really pacified the Muslim community. Because I know pre 9/11, the Muslim community in the U.S. was a lot better on these issues than post 9/11. Right. And yeah. a lot of There's it no because censoring. Of, well, yeah. I mean, you government have to worry about the Patriot Act and things like that, too. Yeah, 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 exactly. And exactly. don't worry. I mean, let, let's not forget the fact that the government did plant molds. I mean, there's yeah, a lot of. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> there's but a that, lot of reasons. I mean, there's good reasons for Muslims to be very careful what they of say. Course, of course. But then you look at somebody like uh, Mark Lamont Hill, right? Who came out, what he said about Palestine. See, this is where I think, um, you know, because we want we did want to talk about Palestine a bit also, yeah. but this is where I think the over talking about everything except for Palestine right now. We'll yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll segue into that. Sorry, the, the <laughs> overstepping of Israel and Zionists on people who speak out on Palestine 
is going to start to bite, bite them in the butt. And it started to happen with Mark Lamont Hill. Yes, he got fired from CNN, but you know what happened? He was able to talk about Palestine on the Breakfast Club, right? On, on the Palestinian occupation. You would have never heard, he would have never gotten that opportunity if he never said what he initially said that got him fired from CNN to begin with, yeah. right? And funny, so yeah. this is where Allah opens doors for you when you actually start trying to do the right thing, right? Allah will open doors for you where you don't even know, where you don't even see that exists. And that is the problem. Our, our framework is so material and focused on the material outcomes that we forget that Allah, at the end of the day, everything is by his will. If you yeah. speak out and you do what's right, Allah will take care of you. And if you believe that, he truly will. He'll give you an opportunity to to spread your message, spread the message you want to send. Yeah, you, want you and Abby Martin was on the podcast, on Joe Rogan's podcast. She just oh, yeah. dropped something about Palestine and how Palestinians are treated. Oh, she killed and, it on that podcast. And I was just like, wow, she Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can utilize anybody he wants to raise awareness about his ummah, right? And you no. mentioned a certain word. What was that? You said something about being connected to the ummah. What's that new term they have about ummah? Ummatism. <laughs> um, um, ummatism, right? Yeah. I, I hate that word, man. It no, it is. But guess what? That's one thing that <coughs> we have to raise the awareness of to our fellow brothers and sisters yeah. is being aware of your ummah is a part of your iman. Yeah. yeah, you can't you separate your, your body's hurting than all of your. You body. can't separate even if there's an ocean between us. It's still our issue, right? And it's yeah. still our children. It's still our mothers. It's still our fathers, and we can't separate it. And the reason why I mentioned the whole thing about us being very comfortable is because when we're that comfortable, we don't think about who's mm -hmm. on the other side of the ocean or the sea. You know what I'm saying? And we're only concerned with ourselves, and even that, we're not doing a very good job with. So. As far as connection with the Ummah, and that's why I was so glad we were able to talk to you today, is you're bringing that back and you're kind of just shaking us up in this slumber that we're in and giving us real information, you know, of, of what's happening um, in Palestine and, yeah. and everything that's in the news now about anybody who, uh -oh, who some. boycotts or, you know, part of any boycott or has negative stuff to say about Israel, there's going to be consequences, right? Yeah. Well, Sam, can you briefly talk about something that a lot of Muslims don't know about, something that happened just over the past week with regards to the sister in Texas who declined um, a government position. I think she was an educator in the yeah. Department of Education, or she was a teacher maybe. Yeah. But she, she was forced to sign something that was um, yeah. saying that she wouldn't participate in any kind of boycott against the state of Israel, the illegal state of Israel. And um, what will... Can you give us a brief outline of what yeah, transpired so the, and how how is that even legal? So this is um, so this is the second time that happened in Texas. Another time that happened was during the was it Hurricane Harvey was called? I forget the name of the hurricane. Um, when when the hurricane happened, they had people sign uh, uh, before they get aid. They're supposed to sign that uh, a form that they don't support BDS, right? And this is again, I think this is Israel overstepping. Right, we're trying to influence policy, but in a way, in the, in the social media world, where this is starting to overstep, right? Where um, they're in their minds, we're expanding out to the West Bank. We're taking all of Palestine right now. We have nothing to lose. The only thing that's like really bothering us is BDS, and as long as we criminalize that, that's it. Like we got what we want, right? But what they're doing now is they're overstepping in a way that people can recognize, right? Netanyahu supporting Trump, um, these BDS laws. Um, and it, these BDS laws are going around the whole country, right? Like there was one law uh, suggested in New York State where businesses uh, that are boycotting uh, uh, doing BDS would be shut down, or which is how do you track somebody is boycotting something, right? A business is boycotting, and then they also said people who support BDS. This is in New York, right? A liberal capital, right? Um, if they support BDS, there will be a registry with their information, public information, on there. Right, where they work, where they live, uh, their names, etc. Right, like that's crazy, right? Um, and these kinds of legislations are going around the whole country, are starting to spread throughout the whole country. Um, there was a case in Arizona with Hatem Bezian when he tried to speak there, he was barred by the uh, University of Arizona uh, or Arizona State. I don't remember one of those two. Um, and they're doing a lawsuit right now against that law, and they're winning, to my knowledge. Um, but this is a bipartisan effort too, right? Like it's Democrats and Republicans. It's not some left wing versus right wing thing or liberal versus uh, you know conservative thing. This is a bipartisan effort to criminalize uh, 
Palestinian activists, right? And it's deeply troubling for me that many Muslims have abandoned Palestine and abandoned it as a left-wing issue, right? We're like, oh, it's all just these left-wing sec- Well, you know why it's all these left-wing secular activists? It's because the MSAs, the Masaj had refused to do any work with it, right? And so where do people go? They went to the SGP, the the SGP, which was in their school, which might be dominated by like Marxists or whatever, and because that's the only people willing to work on Palestine, because Muslims don't want to, because they're scared, and then that's how you get like this left wing kind of like domination of the Palestinian of the Palestine narrative in the U.S., right? And you take out that Islamic element to it, um, that's missing now, and so it's really it's really upsetting for me that many Muslims have abandoned this issue as something that you know. Uh, it's it's like like it's like a secular issue now it's not even like an islamic issue anymore it's yeah. really troubling especially because it's a it's, it's an oppressed oppression is an islamic issue right oppression yeah. of oppression of people is or something we should care being. about yeah. any human being right we have a we have a dignity from allah allah gives us dignity as his creation by the fact that by by virtue of being a creation of allah we all deserve dignity right um regardless of who you are and so Anybody who's oppressed, but it's even more egregious because it's Muslims who are predominantly being oppressed in Palestine. And it's an Aqsa being occupied, yeah. right, in Palestine as well. So. But I think, you know, even with the, with the with the previous generation, when I say previous generation, like children right now who are in middle school and high school, they barely know what Palestine is, unfortunately. And yeah. I, I think there's a reason for that. Uh, and, but the previous generation of those, you know, who have children now, um, I think there were two parts to it. One is they tried and they gave up hope about what's going to happen in Palestine because they feel like the system was kind of skewed against them, right? And then, you know, we have even a, a subcategory of that where they, where we were growing up and the uncles would say that, you know, Palestine has the access to the button. If they just press one button, the whole world is going to be blown up, yeah. right? There, so there, there's that element to it where Israel controls everything, which is quite the contrary. You know, that's not true. Israel has a big brother that's supporting them, that empowers them. Yeah. And the, the, the other is that... Um, you know the 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 access to uh, uh, giving out information to the world. I think back then it was just masjid initiatives, or even a convention. Let's just say the you know the Isna convention would talk about, or the Ikna convention would talk about raising awareness about Palestine. But in the '90s, right in the early 2000s, it was kind of just those people who attended there. The beautiful thing about a platform of podcasts is you can get people all over the world listen to you. Much you have a much bigger audience now. Right. Yeah. So this is this is actually a, a, a more beneficial thing for us now to give us hope to think that, hey, if you uh, got sick of talking about the Palestine issue, now you can utilize this, you know, m- this, this, you have so much more of an audience now online and you can without getting involved into, you know, um, anything that, you know, what, what I'm trying to basically say is you should be very goal, goal oriented. If you see an issue now, well, you can raise awareness you, about it on a just, different level. You just nailed it right there. What? I think in order to combat the, the Palestinian fatigue, yeah. is cr- you have to give people realistic goals. Yes. Even if it's BDS, yeah. they, ha- they can't be giving a million different products on, on the BDS list. That people just can't keep track of. Find two to three of the most egregious offenders or the biggest, biggest contributors to the state of Israel, and then you make sure that everyone in the community, all through every masjid in the West, they they know about that and you just publicize the heck out of it. You don't have to give them a, a list that they just can't. They're not going to be taking that list with them to the grocery store and say like, "Hey, cross referencing every product they buy." It's just ridiculous. So you got to make realistic goals. I I really believe that the whole fatigue is, is playing into what the Zionists want. They want people to be tired of it. They want the, the Palestinians themselves to be completely tired of it. A resigned fate where they only have the option of leaving Gaza and going to Jordan or any other refugee or camp. Or be subservient slaves. Yeah. That's it. Or, or, yeah, just, or just live in that, that yeah. giant refugee camp. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and uh, the the issue for me when we were talking about, you know, being a patriot, I know Mort was talking about you could still be a patriot and, and, and Brother uh, Hassan was, you know, we're going along that, uh, that, 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 um, that pattern one thing i want and this is my personal opinion i don't know if you guys agree with me man but one thing that we learned from all of this is that whether you're a palestine palestinian in palestine it's not israel it's palestine there is no israel um 
or you're a Muslim in the West, in the UK or Islam, I am personally led to believe now that a Muslim in this world doesn't actually have, doesn't belong anywhere. Yeah, I agree. If what, Even if you're in a Muslim country, we can't be fooled, man. And I think this is the perspective. Youth, listen, pay attention. Islam isn't some left-wing thing now or trend. Islam is something very, very real. And I'm just going to talk about very briefly. Do you remember when Abu Bakr and Muhammad Sallallahu went and talked to Bani Shaiban and Musanna ibn Haritha, who was a general who could have been a Sahabi because he sat in front of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi but didn't accept the message of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He ended up being a Tabi'i, meaning the generation after the Sahaba, even though he saw Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr, went and talked to him, and he had two of his other you know, uh, Maghluq ibn Amr and somebody else in Hani was his first name. And then you have Muthanna ibn Haritha, three of Bani Shayban. Bani Shayban was a tribe that protected the borders of uh, uh, the Persian Empire and the Arabian Peninsula. And they were paid and employed, meaning Bani Shayban, an Arab tribe was paid and employed by the Persian Empire to protect the borders so the Arabs wouldn't seep in. And, 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 you know, cause any issues and they'd be given gifts, you know, on a yearly basis and lots of money. And they were known as a war tribe, very strong tribe. Uh, Bani Shayban, when, when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr see them, see Bani Shayban at, at one of the Hajj seasons. Uh, I'm going to make this really, really fast because it's a, long, it's a beautiful story. And Muslim Ibn Haritha, after talking to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, listen, everything you said is nice and good. But my father always told me to side with power. And you're weak. That's the first reason why he didn't side with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second thing he said, and this whole conversation that we had will summarize in this one thing, he said that people of power and kings will never like this message that you have. Yep. The people of power and the kings and the rulers do not like this. And we don't want to cause any problems with the Persian Empire because they're paying us. Right? So... A lot of these issues in Islam lead me to believe whether you're living in a Muslim world, don't think you're safe from everything. And whether you're living in a non-Muslim world, that you're safe from... There's no such thing, like you said, as getting comfortable. Muhammad Sallallahu said to Khadija radiallahu anha, لا راحة بعد اليوم. There's no rest after today. There's no such thing as rest. Even though we're there. And I'm more guilty than anybody else, man. I take like a two-hour nap after I get back from work every day, dude. Just ask my wife, you know. Um, but... It's again. This is this is helping myself and all of us, inshallah. Um, There's no such thing as being comfortable, dude. Yeah. And this is not our natural habitat. Our natural habitat is up there, in yeah. Jannah. But Allah gave us capabilities to acclimate ourselves to our environment, so we can be here temporarily. But we're never going to be comfortable here if we're thinking about Islam. Have you ever think about? Have you ever thought about the times that you feel more comfort is when you're actually not really thinking about Allah yeah. and His Rasul and you're not, yeah. that's when and that's good Allah gave us that escape yeah. but that's the test right is you can't you have to be in touch which is why you have to remind people you know we had a brother from Islamic Oasis on Muhammad Shirazi mm -hmm. and yourself people like yourself kind of give us that reminder of what's really happening to kind of wake us back up again you know um, just before you know when, when Sim told me that you were coming on I just you know was reading about yourself and I was like man how I actually haven't even talked about the Palestinian issue in like three, four months to anybody, you know. And uh, Jazakallah Khan for raising that awareness for us, bro, because it, it helped us too. Even though we're supposed to be the podcast and people may think that, you know, we're, we're not susceptible, you know, because yeah. we are superheroes as the Mad Woman looks. So, but so, even wait, superheroes so, so, are affected uh, by this. I just want to like... Yeah, uh, as, as we wrap up, Hussam, can you just finish off with any closing thoughts that you have? Yeah, yeah. So I was going to say that... Um, I just want to push back against the idea. I don't think the issue is BDS. I think the issue is that a lot of the leadership that we're promoting, that we're pushing for Palestine, a lot of them were imprisoned or excommunicated by the Muslim community, right, in some way, shape, or form. And a lot of it was through Zionist channels and Islamophobic channels. Like you have the Holy Land Five, right? right? Um, uh, and then you have like some scholars who are just blacklisted or some people who are just blacklisted. Um, now, with that said, I just want to like leave off with like a little bit of hope um, for me, at least with Palestine is that, um, you know, I think for any issue, you know, I think we we see the material conditions of the Muslims and we're like, wow, like there's no way this can ever get better. Right. But I truly do believe in the ayah where Allah says, um, you know, with hardship comes ease. Right. Um, and that, you know. For example, in a case like Palestine, I mean, Palestine is an example, but this can apply anywhere, 
Syria or wherever. Israel is so expanding so much into the West Bank that it just seems like they're going to take over Palestine as a as a singular state. Now, two state solution has been the main talking point for ages. But because what what Israel is doing, those who are committed to justice in Palestine for Palestinians now can actually start calling for something like a one state solution on behalf of Palestine without it being taboo because Israel has made a two state solution impossible, for example, right? And I think that these kinds of oversteps that many of these governments do because they're human beings, right? They plan, their plans can move mountains from its course, but Allah plans and, you know, and his plan ultimately rules. And I think at the end of the day, these people, they're overstepping, they're evil, will come back to bite them. And inshallah, you know, our community in the U.S., um, at least, you know, we can support our Muslim brothers and sisters wherever when they actually, when they, when they need it most, right? When they need to push back against it most, right? And inshallah, I hope that we all always remain hopeful, um, that, you know, we always remain, uh, you know, conscious, right? We don't let it make us hopeless or depressed. We always understand that there's a greater plan behind it, that Allah will always protect this ummah. Um, and that at the end of the day, this isn't the last abode, right? Like at the end of the day, no matter how many people die, you know, their last abode is in Jannah or, you know, mm-hmm. is in the afterlife, right? Um, you know, and also I just ask for people to, you know, make thought for me, for my guidance, for my, uh, you know, that I'm always on top of my work, that I'm, uh, you know, uh, I keep myself accountable and, you know, to make the out for, you know, traversing tradition as well, you know, the work that we're doing, um, you know, to make the out for the Mad Mom Luke's as well, because they're doing uh, great at yeah. work by giving people this platform. Um, yeah, so. man, you guys are doing some fantastic work. Uh, I mean, some of the, I really encourage people to go ahead and check out traversing traditions and shall we'll have some more, people on who will be able to talk about um, how their whole blog got set up, but it's a really good story. I talked to uh, Hussam and, and the I- Imani about it as well, and it's, it's great. Just amazing stuff that you guys are doing. But, uh, more, did you have anything you want to chime in with, or you good? No, I'm good. All right, so let's give a quick shout-out to our sponsors. Thank you, sponsors, for believing in our effort and uh, really giving us the backbone to go forward with the whole YouTube experience. HalfHourDean.com is the place you go where you or anyone you know is looking for a significant other. Go for the private matrimonial experience where you don't have to get all the neighbors and uh, all the community members in the know of what you're, what you're doing online. You know, that's your business. HalfHourDean.com. Wahedinvest.com is the website you go to to set up a uh, to get involved in halal investing. Make sure making sure that your income that you're generating is being earned in a halal manner. And finally, mywasia.com is it a website that was set up by none other than Sheikh Joe Bradford. He set it up so that you can uh, set up an Islamic will in as little as 15 minutes. Go to mywasia.com, complete your Will in as little as 15 minutes, and then you just go to the bank or a notarizer and uh, notarize it, and all, and then you have a Islamic will ready and made. That being said, um, next wait, can I just say, yeah, go ahead. No, you can't say anything. Go ahead. Now. <laughs> Time's done, buddy. That's I just it. want, I just want everybody because I prom, I made a, pro- I promised this. Go ahead, uh, man. Go ahead. Um, everybody to make the out for the people of Sudan right now. They're undergoing, you know, a delayed Arab Spring, I guess you could say, but they're being, you know, putting their lives on the line and they're being put in danger. They were not, they have not had, the government has not been giving them food. It's not been giving them money, has been basically stealing their money. Um, um, and they're finally protesting against a, you know, 30 year long, you know, oppressive, abusive dictator. Is uh, this is this is the protest started I believe two days ago. Um, so may Allah in South or North? Uh, uh, north in Sudan in Sudan and in, in North Sudan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so may Allah grant them success. Um, Amen. and may they avoid the same mistakes of the Egyptian revolution. Inshallah, as well. I mean, uh, all right, man. For questions, comments, and concerns, email us at info at the Make sure you give us a follow on Twitter or Facebook. 
and Instagram as well. So uh, be sure if you have any uh, feedback regarding what we talked about today, let us know in the comments below. And make sure to like and subscribe. All right. Uh, that being said, for my co-host, Mord Sheikh Amir and Hossam Gamia, we bid you farewell. Oh, Mad Moon Looks will be out of commission next week. We are on vacation. Sorry. from <laughs> Christmas <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> We're going out to the mountains. I'm trying to get the family what, a little bit more acclimated to the mountains. Oh, they they have never the seen the majestic mountain? mountains of the, the West. So I, want I just to, found it funny that you the picked West. Christmas people out there. The snowy white Christmas mountains. Is uh, that why, huh? The Coors bring, Light Mountains. Bring back <laughs> some <laughs> we're, going, <laughs> we're going to Colorado, so yeah, Inshallah. hopefully, inshallah, we're, we'll have a good time. Salam. All right, guys. We'll see you next. Uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Okay. Inshallah, brother Hassan was great, my man. All right, man. Thank, thank you for having me, guys.